Um, I had the opportunity last month uh, to visit uh, WPC. Uh, just one little minor detail. I still have HPC uh, hard-coded in my brain, so I apologize if I still use the old term. But um, And this was an experiment which they were conducting. Uh, that's what they've been doing. They've been hosting um, many um, test beds, as I have come to learn. And I was able to participate in the winter weather experiment for 2013, and that's what my um, talk is going to be about. Um, what I'm going to try to do is how they use the ensembles, uh, uh, integrate the model guidance, and the, these forecast tools, which I'll be showing, are experimental in nature. They're not exactly uh, operational yet, but they may become operational. And then a big uh, deal issue is, is how do they use these tools and communicate uncertainty, and that's going to be a big portion of my presentation as well. So first, I'll just a quick overview of what the, the goals of the experiment was. And as I said, is to how do we use these ensembles and the information. Uh, also a big issue is we've become aware that the snowfall accumulations in the models are quite simple. I'll uh, show that. But they're trying to improve on the microphysics schemes, and this was a big aspect of the experiment. Another um, thing which I will show you is how they um, look um, into the ensemble uh, products and how they are used. A small aspect of what we're also using and was quite experimental was the um, looking at the four and five day outlook um, regarding uh, winter weather. And then a big item, as I've already said, is how do we effectively communicate uncertainty in our forecast and, of course, provide decision support services. So um, what we did basically for um, five days was we would um, examine the model guidance, just like how the forecast would do, and we would draw, you know, basically draw a choice of three graphics. Uh, we would either select a 2-inch, 4-inch, or 8-inch snowfall, or if we felt like um, mixed precipitation was an issue, such as freezing rain or sleet, um, we would only forecast like two snowfall amounts, and then the third chart would be addressing the uh, mixed precipitation events. And off, write a forecast discussion, which is what is, occurs every day in the in a forecast office or at a, um, um, at a national center. And then we will use this information and, and we would draw up a um, graphic and then have a mock decision support briefing. And then we would actually go back in and in the afternoon and do a four to five day outlook and then also um, verify the previous week's um, forecast and see how some of these experimental tools uh, panned out. Uh, my goals for this presentation, uh, I've already addressed the decision support. Again, that's a big item, but I'm saving that for last. Uh, I'm not going to try to teach you how to use these forecast tools. All I'm going to do is make you exposed to them, just introduce them, and hopefully when they become, when you see them again in the future, you'll know, yeah, what are they? And then I have my own big plug-in for um, WPC. This was emphasized uh, to me, and I'm going to emphasize it here, is forecasters are encouraged to chat with, the, with WPC. Um, their goal is to provide a big picture view of the situation, but um, for them to understand local WFO issues, they need that communication. 
And to serve as my summary, I have a quiz. So in, in this experiment, we have, we have like um, five models, the SREF, NAM, um, something I did not know, but ensemble is becoming a big item. Um, HPC had their own ensembles, which comprised of um, the SREF, uh, the GFS, the European, and the deterministic models, uh, NAM, GFS, uh, the Canadian, and of course the European. And then um, also there was the what's called the AFWA, which I believe is the Air Force version of the um, WARF. And there were two, um, two models of those that we used. Basic rundown of the SREF, and all I'm trying to show you here is how they calculate um, um, snowfall. And as you can see, it's very temperature dependent. Um, at 10 degrees, it's 14 to 1. At freezing, it's um, 8 to 1. And it's set at a maximum of 28 to 1, which we sometimes see here locally in, in Colorado. So I was introduced to a new technique, which they have in the NAM. It was the rover technique. Um, I'm somewhat more familiar with, um, with the caribou, caribou tool. But, so this was uh, new to me. And it uses seven predictive variables and basically um, moisture um, distribution throughout various layers. And, and with given also consideration to um, surface conditions. And they use this to come up with a, as parts of their snowfall act accumulation. And then um, the auto ensemble that the HPC uses, um, uh, again, they apply the rover technique to the NAM and GFS. Uh, 11 to 1 um, uh, snow ratio, and they also add um, climatology um, to, the, um, to the ensemble. Then to the um, AFA ensembles, again, it's, it appears to me that's mostly um, Temperature is is um, used for to, to determine the um, snow to liquid ratio. So that's the um, guidance um, that uh, that they use to calculate and uh, snowfall uh, accumulation. Uh, what we would uh, look at were primarily two experimental techniques and. This was the SREF weighted mean, and then um, what was called the rhyme factor. And we would try to verify if this actually provided any improvement. So this is um, the SREF weighted mean. And what it does is basically it ranks the best to worst uh, and they look at these differences between these um, the ensemble members, and the members that had the smallest differences were given more weight as opposed to the outliers. So, uh, so basically, uh, uh, the smaller the differences, the um, are given a much more higher weight as opposed to. Uh, a solution that may be on the fringe or the rhyme factor uh, looks at uh, uh, percent um, frozen uh, precipitation reaching the ground and also is looking at uh, partly as a rover technique but uh, various numbers um, they are used 
lower the values um, indicated um, fluffy snow, and then very high values of the rover technique uh, would show um, basically frozen precipitation, such as sleet. So this is um, an example. Uh, up to the top left is the rover technique, and then uh, they had frozen precipitation, the rime factor, and then the um, rime factor modified is on the bottom right. Uh, during the week that I was there, we did not see any good frozen precipitation events, so we'll um, toss those, the top right and the bottom left um, out. And what I will try to at least try to show you here is if you look at the rover technique out the top left, you'll see that the snow accumulation is, the data is somewhat smooth. Whereas if you look um, at the bottom right, uh, the rhyme factor modified snowfall, if you look in the top left corner of that, you'll see that it actually provides more detail and may be perceived as more realistic. And just um, um, finishing up on that last slide, um, what we've at least our, during the verification, it's, all of us seem to agree that, uh, like the rhyme factor uh, a bit more in terms of that provides more detail, but what we also tend to agree uh, agreed on is it was a wash. In areas where it actually showed improvement, there were also equal areas where it um, did not improve the forecast. So, so we like the prospects of the rhyme factor modified snowfall, but it's not yet. Uh, it needs uh, more work and probably more study for it to become beneficial. So moving forward to the ensemble portion, um, there's a, ensembles are becoming a big item and we're going to see more of them. At least that appears to be as a trend. We have the, what I will try to introduce to you is the ensemble sensitivity. Another, the Europeans have a, um, uh, their own way of looking at the ensemble sensitivity and what they call the extreme forecast index. Uh, we may be more familiar with standardized anomalies and, of course, the spaghetti ensemble plots. And another thing which we saw a little bit of is we would look at maximum and minimum snowfall in the model data and the ensemble presentations of that forecast. So this is an example of ensemble sensitivity, and basically what it's trying to show you, uh, uh, for example, taking a look at the top left, you have a broad area of low pressure, and where you see the green areas, basically like a dipole, is where there's the greatest model spread between the ensemble members. Um, the top right is well, the top left, it was looking at a um, certain level that I guess was the, using the um, sea level pressure mean. And the top right is the variance. So what they try to do is that in areas where they had um, um, dipoles where you would see where the greatest spreads are is, is that's indicative of that the positions of the lows had the greatest uncertainty. And uh, the first two are the uh, examples of that. And then on the bottom right, the, uh, is the surface pressure is more or less looking at the intensity and it tells you where the um, 
greatest uncertainty is where the surface low pressure may be positioned. Uh, I apologize for a lot of words here, and I decided just to put this on here just as reference. Uh, I'm, I don't really not ask anyone to read this, but if anybody wants to take a look at this um, presentation again in the future uh, and look at this into detail, I just uh, added this um, information. But the idea is, is to try to identify features that you may possibly go back into time where you see the greatest spread, um, like in what you might see in this chart is you may be able to see X's where the um, biggest spreads are in time, and what you attempt to do is that you go back into time to basically at the zero hour, and you might discover a wave or a feature that is causing the greatest model spread. And it turns out that I have a very good example of um, showing what that is. Oh, and um, I'm sorry, I apologize, but uh, before we uh, get to that example, I also wanted to show you the, um, the extreme forecast index. And this is a... Um, uh, so similar philosophy, but what they do is take the difference between uh, the forecast distribution and the climatological mean and try to pinpoint or <coughs> alert areas which show the biggest anomalies. Now we get to the um, example that I was trying to show. And during the, at the end of the week that I was there, we had that big blizzard up across the northeast, and that's a satellite um, image of that. And we go back into um, time as the situation um, evolved uh, as a radar image, and basically you could see the two distinct features, and the one that I want to pinpoint is the big moisture source or the anomalies um, had to pertain to the um, southern feature that's across the southeast and how this is phased with the wave that's coming out of the um, northern plains. But uh, the source of this, if we were to go back to, uh, three days, There's your blizzard, or the possible source of the blizzard. Uh, it's basically it was how the models treated that short wave off of the Baja California coast. And so if you were able to go back to the time, you would understand where, um, what wave or what feature is going to give you, I guess, get a feel of... Um, uh, your focus uh, is, is what's going to contribute to your um, big your, your big storm. So um, with this, uh, I want to go to what we do with um, decision support, and of course, there's uh, three items that we focus on: is the where, the when, and the what. Um, one thing which to emphasize um, emphasize to us was there is no why. Um, some of your high-end users may may want to know the why, but for the most part, it's uh, very much uh, downplayed. Um, what you really want to focus on is the where. I kind of bring this up because I think this is the biggest challenge um, for forecasters because we are we spend a lot of energy on the why, and then when we, in our decision um, briefings, that's not what we, that is not part of the message. Uh, something else which is uh, our 
or the three C's for what I would call a successful um, weather briefing. Um, for the person that's in the audience being briefed, um, the items are confident. It's basically how confident are you in your forecast? They're going to judge that confidence by how they perceive your competence. So if that's essentially your knowledge in the situation. And then the comfort factor is essentially how well they know you. And if you build a very good rapport and if they know you quite well, then chances are they're going to perceive you as being competent and they'll be more confident in the information that you provide them. Colors. Colors uh, send message to particular events. Um, people uh, respond to these colors, and this is a chart of how uh, we could use colors to um, deliver the message. Um, for example, light blue is your low-end snow, plowable snow, uh, your dark blue, for example, is crippling snow events. Uh, red. That's the standout color. That's the color that you use for your um, big message. In this case, I have it labeled as a nice storm, but, um, but if you have a message, you, an area that is the primary focus, um, red is the one that you want to use. And another thing is white expresses uncertainty. In this case, it could also um, be used for two or more scenarios. If you expect um, potentially there could be two scenarios for a certain area, then there's some uncertainty in that area. The, um, the blue colors from light to dark. When you add wind to those events, then they have more impact. So uh, either though you might have light accumulations, of course, uh, if you have strong winds, then you may have ground blizzard conditions. And of course, the more the snow accumulations, uh, we know quite well that um, and the situation um, becomes worse, whereas a crippling snow event may actually become paralyzing in a worse condition. Um, our, our, our first day, we had a Alberta clipper, and this was what we uh, used uh, for our first graphic. Again, uh, we used um, red as our wintry mix. Uh, mixed precipitation, that being snow, um, possible freezing rain, with snow to the north and then expected rain to the south. And we tried to use the yellow hash marks to show the, um, how the system evolves or progresses with time. Then on our second day, we knew about that the blizzard in the northeast was going to be possible, but there was a lot of doubt exactly um, where the transition snow area from rain to snow was going to be. Um, one of the areas of uncertainty of, was actually New York City and Long Island, and possibly extending up into um, uh, parts of Massachusetts. And something that we didn't notice when we did this, uh, we had a spilling error, and that was first thing that was noticed when we gave our mock decision briefing. And another chart um, here, and this is just for your information, is the hierarchy of disruptions, um, internal and external criteria. There is a fifth order on here, but uh, they're essentially all the same. It's just minimal impacts. So I just showed you the uh, basically the fourth orders of the worst being paralyzing, 
then it goes down the chain from crippling, inconvenience, um, to nuisance, and how that impacts the various activities, such as um, transportation is the biggest item that includes uh, possibly rail and air that you may see at the bottom. But of course, um, uh, schools are impacted as well as uh, constructions and retail. So, and then on our third day, uh, we had another um, potential blizzard that looked like it was going to extend into the northern plains, basically from the Dakotas southward into Nebraska. They again. We try to highlight that in red. I only show you these um, these graphics uh, ba basically to say were we successful at um, conveying the message because um, that's what we are trying to do. So that's just my question to you uh, is whether we succeeded in delivering that message or not. And then uh, WPC is looking at providing a four to five day outlook forecast, but that's uh, very experimental and evolving. Um, they are uh, just trying to see what type of direction they um, want to go with this. And I just show that here just to make you aware of, um, of this um, possibility. <coughs> So I promise a quiz at the end, and this serves as my summary, essentially. So just um, various definitions, what ensembles may mean, and uh, and basically the big thing is that they serve as a alarm bell or alerts the forecaster to potentially extreme events, either though the index itself um, doesn't mean that extreme event will occur, but it just, again, is something that merits further examination. And then a summary of what um, a good decision support briefing may contain, and of course, want to emphasize the when, where, and what. Um, we've heard, heard that um, many times, but also to emphasize the use of colors. They do deliver a message. And the three C's of confidence, competent, and comfort. And lastly, uh, collaboration with, with um, WPC. Uh, uh, they have a, may, they may see uh, more information that, that the forecast office has and so if if you have a particular question um, or a concern that needs to be addressed, uh, feel free to chat with them. And that's uh, that's 